Mark chapter 5, as we continue looking at the gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 5. This morning we will be in verses 1 through 20. If you would, please stand with me and let's give honor to the reading of God's Word. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him on the, uh, out of the tombs. Came out, but immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains. And the chains had been pulled apart by him and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. He cried out with a loud voice and said, what, I, what have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. For he had said to him, Come out, man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave him permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There were about two thousand and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. So those who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country. And they went out to see what had happened. Then they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened to him who had been demon possessed and about the swine. Then they began to plead with him to depart from the region. And when he had got into the boat, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in the Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. And all marveled. Dear God, we praise you and glorify you. We ask this time that you would fill this place. That you would open up our hearts and minds. That we would worship you. And that we will all be amazed at your power, your majesty and love. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you would please be seated. A few years ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that the customer of Starbucks were giving their very pricey drinks an average ranking. They're saying they tasted mediocre. And so Starbucks concluded that the problem was that the baristas were going way too fast. So they told the baristas to slow down and only prepare two drinks at a time. Take your time, and that would improve the quality of the drinks. A few months later, Starbucks was surprised to learn that the customers were still complaining about the mediocre drinks, but now they're saying we had to wait twice as long to get them. The Wall Street Journal said this, The problem with Starbucks is that they focused on the wrong problem. By focusing on the wrong problem, they came to the wrong conclusion. By having the wrong conclusion, they had the wrong response. And the problem was not that uh, the baristas were taking too long. The problem was that they were using mediocre ingredients. If they had focused on the ingredients and had the right conclusions of changing the ingredients and then made the change, then they would have gotten to the right act that they wanted to get to. According to the Wall Street Journal, when you focus on the wrong thing, you come to the wrong conclusion, it leads to the wrong response. And that's what often happens when we look at this passage that we're looking at today. So many folks want to focus on the demons. They want to focus on the demon-possessed man instead of focusing on the power and authority of Jesus Christ. And if you focus on anything else besides the power and authority of Jesus Christ, you're going to come to the wrong conclusion and you're going to have the wrong response. You're going to tell your baristas to slow down 
instead of fixing your mediocre ingredients. Or in our case, you're going to miss the opportunity to respond to the power and authority of Jesus Christ in your life. Because that is what this passage calls us to do today. In Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20, Jesus proves that He is God and King by demonstrating His power and authority over the spiritual world. Today, we are going to look at this passage in three parts. The situation, Jesus' authority, and the response. The situation, Jesus' authority, and the response. And then we're going to talk about how it applies to each of us today. And the bottom line is this. If you are a Christian or you're an unbeliever, the reality is, is that Jesus Christ is God and King. And He has the power and authority over everything. And He has the power and authority to forgive sin and rescue anyone who comes to Him in faith from their separation from God. And these truths demand a response from each of us. This morning, if you're a Christian, the only response you can have from this passage is to go tell people what Jesus has done for you out of joy, out of gratefulness. And this morning, if you're not a Christian, the only thing you can do to respond to this passage is to accept God's offer and to come to Him through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the only way to respond. As we begin this morning, let me give you a little bit of context or, or background for our passage. Let me explain how it fits into the book of Mark. Now, our passage is in the book of Mark, which is an account or a telling of the gospel. It's a telling of the good news. That's just what gospel means. It means good news. And the good news is that through His work on the cross, Jesus Christ offers to anyone who comes to Him in faith rescue from their separation from God. That's the good news. That's the great news. And that's what this book is all about. Now our passage is part of a larger section that begins in chapter 3, verse 6, verse 7, and goes to chapter 6, verse 6. And the focus of this section is answering the question, who is Jesus? And the one who's answering that question is Jesus himself. He declares over and over again that he's God and king. And he proves that he's God and king by doing what only God can do through his miracles. And he's doing all this, revealing himself and proving his identity so that everyone will know that he can forgive sin and rescue man from the separation from God. In this section, the question is not who Jesus is. The question is how do people respond to him when he reveals who he is. Now in chapter 4, verses 1 through 34, what we see is that Jesus has been sitting in a boat off the shore of Galilee, teaching his disciples, teaching his followers, teaching the crowds about himself in parables. He has been saying that I am God and King, that the kingdom of God is here is because I am here. And I am going to establish my kingdom. No one can help me, and no one can oppose me. I'm God, and I'm going to do it one way or the other. And how you respond to me makes all the difference. And then in chapter 4, verse 35, to chapter 5, verse 50, 43, Jesus proves that he's God and King. He proves what he's just been teaching about. Through four miraculous events, he does what only God can do, proving what he's just taught. He proves that he is God because he controls nature, because he controls demons, because he controls disease, and because he controls death. Everything that we cannot control bows down before him. Now last Sunday night, we saw that Jesus declared, I'm God and King, as he demonstrated his power and control over nature, as he controlled the Sea of Galilee. Today, we're going to see Jesus say, I'm God and King because I control the spiritual world as he heals a man who is possessed by many demons. Now, as we get to our passage, we see in verses 1 through 5 the situation. The situation, the desperate and hopeless situation that's presented to Jesus in this passage. In verse 1, we see that Jesus finally makes it to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, a five-mile trip by boat that he started in chapter 4, verse 35. He gets to the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, which is a predominantly Gentile or non-Jewish area, area called the Gatherings and the Gerasenes. In this area, it is predominated by ten cities. They're called the Decapolis. In the New Testament language, the word Decapolis actually means ten cities. So they weren't that creative when they named the area. It was just what it was. As Jesus gets there, we see in verse 2 
that there's a man who's possessed by demons comes running toward him. And then verses 3 through 5, we're told about this man. We're told about the situation. We're told how helpless it is, how hopeless it is. We're told that the people who are around this guy have tried to help him. They tried to subdue him. They tried to chain him, but nothing has worked. They have not been able to help this guy in this situation. They are helpless. They are hopeless to fix it, to do anything about it. Then we see it from the guy's position himself. This guy is possessed with an unclean spirit. He is isolated, living in the tombs or, or caves or, or areas cut out of limestone rock. They place dead bodies. This is an unclean area. And day and night, he wanders around, cutting himself, crying out. He is helpless. He is hopeless in this situation. He's an unclean man living with an unclean spirit in an unclean area. And what Mark is telling us that this situation is desperate. No one can fix it. No one can do anything about it. Just like the twelve disciples at the Sea of Galilee rushed around them as it swirled them, as they were helpless and as they were desperate, so this man in this community is desperate with his situation. They cannot help him. They cannot do anything for him. We have to understand the desperation that everyone is feeling. And then in verses 6 through 13, we see the authority of Jesus. As we understand how hopeless and helpless the situation is, Jesus arrives, the one that everything bows down to. He gets out of the boat, and the man who's possessed with many demons bows before him as an act of submission and respect. And the demon cries out, What do you have to do with me? Why are you here, Jesus? Son of the Most High God. You know what I love? Is that people always debate who Jesus is. It doesn't matter if you're an average guy or a university professor. We always argue who is Jesus. You know who knows who Jesus is? The demons. They declare it every time they see Him. They know Him. And they fear Him. Fear is what you hear in these verses. Jesus, why are you here? What are you going to do with us? Jesus, listen, don't torment us. Jesus, don't make us leave this place. Hey, Jesus, there's about 2,000 pigs over there. Give us permission to go over there. They can do nothing without His permission. And Jesus lets them go. 2,000 pigs are possessed, they run off, and they're, they're, they're destroyed. They're killed. Why is this important? Three quick reasons. Number one, we know this guy had a lot of demons. It's more than just one or two to go over 2,000 pigs. Second thing, demons are bit on destruction. They destroy everything, something you don't want to play with. Number three, physical, observable, verifiable proof that Jesus is in control. No one can argue what Jesus has done. No one can argue what has happened. The townspeople cannot write it off. They have to say something has taken place here because all of our pigs have committed suicide or however you want to put it. That was bad. I had to work it in there. Back in my mind all morning. It's a gift to me. Listen. you got to what's happening here. Don't let it pass over. This is about Jesus declaring I'm God and King. That's what this is about. It's about Him declaring that I'm over everything. As I am over the spiritual world, everything bows before me. This is a God that could not help Himself. This is a townspeople that could not do anything for Him. This is the guy, when Jesus walks up, the demons bow before him, obey him, beg him to do anything. Jesus is in control. Just as Jesus is in control of the natural world, as he controlled the Sea of Galilee, he is in control of the spiritual world, as he controlled these demons. 
Jesus is saying, I am God and King. I am fulfilling my kingdom. And everything that I have said is true. So how you respond to me makes all the difference. Remember, this is what this section is all about. It's about Jesus revealing himself. And how people respond. That's what chapter 3 verse 7 and chapter 6 verse 6 is about. So how did these people respond to Jesus? How did they respond to the revelation of His power and His authority in a situation that they could do nothing? Well, that's what we see in verses 14 through 20. We see their response. The first response is in verses 14 through 17. And this is the response of the people. The guys who are working with the pigs see what happens. They run off and they tell everybody. The city, countryside, it don't matter. They don't tell anybody what has just happened. People say, I want to see this for myself. So they come back and they see this guy who they could not fix, who they could not help, who they could not control, sitting calmly in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. Are they thankful? Are they amazed? Are they grateful? Do they want to hear more about this Jesus? Do they want to talk to him about what's going on? Are they overwhelmed by his power and his authority? No. Verse 15 says that they're afraid. They're afraid of Jesus' power and authority. They're afraid that it may cost them more than 2,000 pigs if he hangs around a little bit longer. They're afraid that he may change them the way that he changed the sky. They're afraid. And therefore, they'd rather live with the illusion that they're in control than live under his power. To leave. Listen. People do the same thing today. They do the same thing today. Jesus reveals his power and authority. But people would rather live chasing their own desires even though it leads to nothing. People would rather deal with problems that they cannot control. People would rather battle the daily demons in their life than give up power and authority to Jesus. Why? Because we're afraid of what we'll have to give up. We're afraid of what he'll ask us to change. We're afraid that we'll have to stop being comfortable. We're afraid of how it's going to affect us. So today, we would rather live under the illusion that we're under control. We would rather cling to a life that's really not worth having than giving Him power and authority in our life. All because we're afraid of what He'll change. Second response we see is in verses 18 through 20. And that's the guy who was once demon possessed. That's the demoniac. He sees Jesus getting in the boat. What does he do? He runs up to Jesus and says, let me go with you. I want to be with you. He is thankful. He is grateful. He understands what Jesus has done for him. He understands what Jesus has rescued him from. He knows exactly where he was and what he has now become. And he is so thankful of what Jesus has done for him. So he says, Jesus, I just want to be with you. And Jesus says, no. This is what I want you to do. I want you to go back to your home, to your family, to your friends, to your community. I want you to go back and I want you to tell them what I've done for you. I want you to see God's grace and God's mercy. I want them to look at you and know that I can change their life the way that I changed yours. I want you to tell them to be my ambassador, to be my example, and say, this is what I offer. You go back and you tell them about me. And because he was grateful, because he was thankful, because he knew what Jesus has done for him, in verse 20 he goes, and he goes to the capitals. He goes to the ten cities. And everybody's amazed. 
Amaze what he says, amaze what he is. Christian, are you still amazed? Are you still amazed at what Jesus has done for you? Are you grateful? Are you thankful? And does it cause you to want to tell people around you what he's done for me, he'll do for you? Are you amazed at what he's rescued you from? Are you still amazed? So as we come to the end of the text, we begin asking the question, well, what does this text, text tell us about Jesus? Uh, what does it tell us about our relationship with Christ? First, we understand this. This passage, it's not about the demons. It's not about the demon-possessed man. It's about Jesus. It's about His power and His authority. And it's that power and authority that demands a response from us. So today we're going to have to make a choice of whether or not we're going to respond to the power and authority of Jesus in our life. So what does that mean to each of us? Well, it depends on who you are. This morning, if you're not a Christian or you don't consider yourself a believer, I do believe right now you're starting to understand that you're not that much different from the demon-possessed guy. That's God's Spirit working in you right now. Now listen, I'm not calling you demon-possessed. I'm not saying you're demon-possessed. I'm not saying you have a legion of demons within you. But I am saying that you've got a legion of some. A legion of despair. A legion of hurt. A legion of loneliness. A legion of separation. A legion of darkness. A legion of pain. Those are the things that you battle. I love the way C.S. Lewis puts it. Author C.S. Lewis as he was talking about his life before Christ. He said, I had a zoo of lust, a bedlam of ambitions, a nursery of fears, a harem of fondled hatreds. My name was Legion. Author Eugene Lowry wrote this. He said, I felt like there were a legion of soldiers inside of me. Sometimes they marched left, sometimes they marched right, sometimes in all different directions. I was pulled one way than another. There was an army inside of me, and I knew I was losing the battle. I do believe if you're honest this morning, you'll admit that you're losing the battle. The desires, the frustrations, the anger, the loneliness, the isolation. You may be thinking, I don't understand how I got this way. I don't understand why I feel this way. Well, let me just tell you in love, it's because you, just like me and everyone else in here, have rejected God. God created you to know Him and to love Him. But you rejected Him. We all have. God didn't reject you. You rejected Him. His will, His way in your life, because you want to do it your will in your way. You want to be your God. And when you choose to be your God, you choose to reject Him. And when you reject Him, you are forever separated from Him. And you can't fix it. Your friends can't fix it. Your family can't fix it. People around you can't fix it. Just like the demon possessed man, you are hopeless and helpless. And it's this separation that leads to the feelings of isolation, sadness, and darkness, and anger, and pain. You can't fix it. But here's the good news. Jesus, God the Son, in His love for you, died on the cross to pay for the penalty of your rejection. So that if you'll come to Him believing that He is God and King, that He can forgive you, that He can rescue you from your separation from God, He'll do just that. The same Jesus who is God and King in control of the spiritual world, the same Jesus who is in control of demons, is the same Jesus who has the power and the authority to forgive sin and reconcile you to God forever. And that's exactly what He wants to do today. That's the offer that's coming to you through the Holy Spirit. Do not be like the townspeople. Do not hold on to a life that's not worth having. Because you're afraid. Accept Christ's offer to be forgiven and rescued. 
and he'll give you the life of living. Just a few moments we're having to call the invitation. It's time that your invited respond as the Holy Spirit is leading you. Now I do believe the Holy Spirit is making it very clear your separation from God because of your sin. And His offer to come to you through faith in Christ. Through the invitation, we'll be standing. I'll invite you to come forward. You can talk to me or, or Mr. Paul. We'll be down front. We'd love to tell you more about Jesus. And His offer to you. So Christian, what does it mean for us to accept the offer? To accept and respond to Jesus' power and authority in our life. Well, Christian, for you and I, it's much more personal. I want to say it's deeply personal. We're not a community of the perfect. We're a community of the forgiven. We are a people who are once just like the demon-possessed man. And you may say, well, I've never been possessed by demon. I get that. But you are just as separated. You are just as lost. You are just eternally separated and rejecting God as this man was. It did not change for you until you accepted His grace, mercy, forgiveness. It did not change for you until you accepted His offer of power and authority in your life. It did not change until Jesus changed you. We as believers can never forget where we came from. We should never forget what we were. We should never forget where we were headed to. We should never forget God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness revealed to us through Jesus Christ. And when we remember who we were and know who we are, then we should be thankful and grateful for what He's done for us. And just like this guy who was demon-possessed, we have been sent as well. This guy says, Jesus, I want to just hang out with you. And Jesus says, no, go. Jesus, I just want to sit around and be a part of you. No, go. I'm sending you. Go to your family, your friends, your community. Tell them what I've done for you. Tell them that you're my ambassador. Tell them what I did for you. I will do for them. Tell them the love and the mercy that God has shown you. Christian, he was sent. And so are we. Listen to what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all, then all die. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for him who died for him and rose again. Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become righteousness of God in Him. Christian, do you remember what you were? Do you remember what He's done for you? Does that gratefulness, does that thankfulness, does that love, does it compel you to live for Him? Does it compel you to go to family and friends and job and community and school and say, listen, this is what Jesus has done for me. And I am his ambassador. He has sent me to you to tell you that he loves you. And what he's done for me, he'll do for you. Do you tell those around you about him? Are you so in love? Are you so thankful? Are you so grateful that all you can do is say, what he's done for me, he's done for you. Can you respond to the power and authority of Jesus Christ? How else can you respond to your salvation? If we're grateful, then we'll.
will go. If we're compelled, we'll realize we've been sent. If we're humbled, we'll tell others about Him. If we're His ambassador, we'll speak on His behalf. Christian, when was the last time you told somebody about Him? How grateful are you? So come kind of the invitation, Christian, what I encourage you to do is use this time to pray, to thank your God and King. Thank Jesus Christ for what He's done for you. And to save my King. And there's someone in our, my home, in my job, in my school, in my community that I need to be your ambassador for. Give me the wisdom, the time, the opportunity to understand you. You open it up, I'll step in. Lord, rekindle my thankfulness for my salvation. Give me the opportunity to tell others about you. As you're praying through that this morning, if you need help or encouragement, the altar is open. Mr. Paul and I will be down front and we pray for those beside you. This morning, it doesn't matter who you are, Christian, or someone who's not there yet. The reality is this, that Jesus Christ is God and King. He is in control. And we have to respond to His power and authority one way or the other. Today, I encourage you to respond by accepting His invitation to come to Him through faith in Christ. Or, out of joy and thankfulness, tell somebody about Him. May we respond to our God and King. And may we live every day amazed by what He's done for us. Father, we praise You.